cattle roping cowboys, lawless mining towns, American icons such as Wild Bill Hickok, Bat Masterson, and Wyatt Earp, legendary outlaws, the James Gang, the Daltons, John Wesley Harden, and Billy the Kid. They're all part of that chapter in American history known as the Wild West. In Outlaws and Gunslingers, the true stories of that special era come alive again. In this episode, we shall see how the American Civil War shaped the greatest and deadliest of the outlaw gangs, the James Younger Gang. The year was 1863. The American Civil War had been raging for two years. No event more than the Civil War would create the cast of characters that would become the icons of the Wild West. The gunslingers that we have come to know and have come to be part of our nation's legends. Many historians today would say the events that later unfolded in the Old West were just an extension of the conflicts and vendettas created during that American nightmare. In the North in 1863, the granddaddy of all gunslingers, Wild Bill Hickok, was a spy and scout for the Union Army. Two years before, he killed his first man while working at a Pony Express station in Nebraska. General George Armstrong Custer was fighting at the Battle of Gettysburg. Northern free settlers were pouring into the Plain states as a result of the 1862 Homestead Act that promised free land. Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency, had just created for Union General George McClellan what would become the Secret Service, and in the process had thwarted an assassination attempt on President Abraham Lincoln. In the South in 1863, Clay Allison, one of the deadliest gunslingers the West would ever see, was part of the 9th Tennessee Cavalry, Populations of Texas Longhorns left behind by the departure of the Mexican ranchers during the Mexican-American War were expanding and roaming free. But the defining event for the unfolding of the Old West took place in the northern state of Kansas when a group of southern guerrilla raiders headed for the pro-Union city of Lawrence. On August the 18th, uh, Quantrill gathered his group together and they marched west uh, from the Kansas City area to the town of Lawrence and on that day they, they began a reign of terror that lasted much of the day going from house to house searching out the men altogether at the end of the day nearly 150 citizens had been uh, massacred. In this group of southern guerrilla raiders were its two most famous leaders, Bloody Bill Anderson and William Quantrill. But just as important among its rank-and-file soldiers were the younger brothers and Frank James, the brother of Jesse James. It is among these raiders that the James Younger Gang would learn to kill without remorse. The guerrilla fighting during the Civil War, the guerrilla fighting that would lead to the outlaw gangs, started early in what would become James Gang country. It was the fight over slavery in Kansas and Missouri. It was known as Bloody Kansas, or the Border Wars. It started in 1854 and continued right through the Civil War and beyond. 
It was the original Wild West. One of the things that was very unique about the Kansas-Missouri border, and this was during the territorial Kansas era from uh, 1854 to 1861, and then on into the Civil War, is the accountability. And I think that that's one thing that defines the West. There is no accountability. Um, during the border war between Kansas and Missouri, the few soldiers that are stationed at uh, Fort Leavenworth, for example, have this whole territory to take care of. There's no way. So everybody knows that. And everybody knows they can get by with anything they decide to do. They might get caught eventually, but they're not going to get caught tonight. And they probably won't get caught tomorrow. And they might not get caught the next day. So there's some time to get by with things. And people took advantage of that. John Brown certainly did. He got by with all kinds of atrocities. So the stage had already been set in Kansas and Missouri. They had a head start on the rest of the country on the Civil War. And it was bloodier. It was more terroristic. It was with the gloves off. And that's the environment that Frank and Jesse and the Youngers and Bill Anderson had fermented in before the war had even started. Once the Civil War broke out in Missouri, a Union border state settled by slaveholding Southerners, there was no choice for her young men. Either you changed your color from gray to blue, or you became a Southern guerrilla fighter. This is just what Jesse and Frank James and the younger brothers eventually did. For them, it was all about getting even with the Yankee Unionists. The cast of characters who were involved in the activities they include, of course, Quantrill, um, the Youngers, the Jameses, um, Bloody Bill Anderson, and so on. These individuals, uh, almost all of them, entered into the war effort as a result of a vengeance. The first supreme leader of the Southern guerrilla bands was a man named William Quantrill. William Quantrill was originally from the state of Ohio, and at the age of 16, he became a teacher. Uh, he taught at several schools in the, in the Ohio area, and uh, at a, approximately 18 to 20, he decided, as so many young men did, to go west, and then made his way over to uh, Missouri, where he, uh, having come from uh, uh, near the South, he, he definitely sympathized with the South. He really is an enigma. Um, Quantrell was a school teacher. He was educated. He was from Ohio. Um, he has no personal axe to grind in the war, not like these Missourians who have had family members or land lost, who have some personal vested interest. Quantrell doesn't. So nobody has ever really figured out what motivated Quantrill. What Quantrill was able to do was bring all the Raider bands together. He was the supreme leader, and his men would follow him anywhere. His men were the ultimate killing machines on horseback, never equaled again in the Old West. This is an incredible group of men. They're incredible horsemen. They all grew up in the country. They all grew up riding horses. As gorillas, they essentially live on horseback for months at a time. So they, next to Comanches, are probably the best horsemen on the planet, the gorillas of western Missouri. Certain stores, banks, and buildings marked for seizure. Then one event in 1863 changed the nature of the war for these gorillas. It was an event that shaped what the West would become after the Civil War. It started when the Union Army was ordered to round up the women and children of known raiders. During the roundup of these loved ones, the guerrillas, mothers and daughters and sisters, they were jailed in Kansas City prior to deportation. Well, one prison collapsed, and I don't know what the 
the, the true reasons were for it. I read various accounts. I per personally don't believe it was intentional. I don't believe even the Yankees were that diabolical to actually kill women and children. I think it was an accident, pure and simple. But the important part of the quotient is that the rebels didn't think this. They thought it was a deliberate massacre of roughly five women and the crippling of others. When that occurred, you basically had a lot of dead men riding. They decided then and there that this, I'm not going to make it out of this war. I might as well take some of them with me. These men are now known as Quantrill's Raiders. Among them was Frank James, who earlier had joined the regular Confederate Army. Frank eventually comes back home and joins Quantrell's Raiders. And I think one of the reasons that Frank joins Quantrell's guerrillas is he's seeing the atrocities that are being committed in Missouri by the Unionists. And it was basically self-defense at that point. I, I really believe that. I think at that point it's self-defense early in the war. Jesse, young, hot-headed teenager, wanted to join Quantrell too, but he wouldn't let him. He was too young. Jesse James would get his chance a year later to kill Northerners with Bloody Bill Anderson. But in August of 1863, Quantrill's raiders were seeking revenge against the Yankee Unionists. Quantrill looked for an opening in the defenses of Kansas. Kansans didn't understand how deep was the hatred Missourians felt for them, the Jayhawkers, who had perpetrated terrible atrocities in the first year and a half of the war. Quantrill set his sights on Lawrence, Kansas. No raid had ever occurred on a city of this size. But Quantrill was able to pull all the bands together. And he found enough men, 450 desperate individuals, who agreed with him, let's punish these people. We're gonna die, we know that, but let's go over there and at least exact some vengeance on these people. On August 21st, the Lawrence Massacre took place. It's the most successful light cavalry raid of the American Civil War. He got in, he got out, he, he accomplished his mission, he lost only a handful of men in the process. He completely wiped out the second largest city in the state, killed 150 men unarmed, by the way, uh, in the process. But the Missourians got their revenge, and William Clark Quantrill got it for them. That's why he is so beloved to this very day. From Lawrence, Quantrill's raiders headed south to Confederate Texas, where they wintered and regrouped. Along the way, they pulled off a second massacre at Baxter Springs, Kansas. After unsuccessfully attacking Fort Blair, fortune turned for the raiders. As luck would have it, a Yankee uh, supply train, roughly 100 soldiers with wagons, was coming down the road, didn't hear the fight. They were right there in front of Quantrell. He's a, Quantrell was a supreme opportunist. He saw what could happen. Taking the fort wasn't going to make it. He attacked the wagon train instead, and the result was within an hour, there were 89 men laying in the road with a neat black hole burned in their head. After the Baxter Springs Massacre, Quantrill went on south to Sherman, Texas, and his groups wintered at Sherman, Texas. And this is where his command fell apart. He began losing this loyalty that he had from the, the, and the Andersons and the Youngers and so on like this. And these individuals who had banded together with their groups began splintering them. And so many of them went their, their separate ways. Many historians say Quantrill lost his stomach for the brutal warfare that his raiders were now engaged in. He returned to Kentucky, where he was shot dead. When the Southern guerrilla raiders returned to Missouri in 1864, they had a new leader, a leader who was happy to have a 16-year-old Jesse James join him. He was Bloody Bill Anderson. Bill Anderson is probably the bloodiest man in American history. And that's not to say that Bill Anderson didn't have reasons to be what he was, bloody. 
But Bill Anderson was a man-killing machine, a homicidal maniac. His father was killed during the Civil War. His sister was killed in a prison collapse. His family was scattered to the wind. And in other words, in other words, Bill Anderson had lost all hope. The Civil War killed everything that Bill Anderson stood for or hoped for. When the Union occupation forces of Missouri made an enemy of Bill Anderson, they made an enemy of the devil. Bill Anderson quite literally was a devil risen from the ground. He becomes a psychotic killer. And unlike Quantrell, who manages to keep a lid on his emotions, Bill Anderson is never able to do that. I don't think Bill Anderson ever expects to survive the war. And Bill's only mission in life at this point is to kill Yankees, as many as he can. And he sets about doing that. And so Bill takes barbarity to new heights. Um, his men scalp. They mutilate. They terrorize. Um, they wore scalps and body parts on their bodies and on their horses. Now, Bill, not being as particular as Quantrell about who he took, was willing to let Jesse James ride with him. And at some point, Frank had joined Bill. Then on October 27, 1864, Anderson was ambushed by Union troops. Caught completely unaware, he was riddled with bullets. Later, Union soldiers propped Anderson's corpse in a chair and placed a pistol in the dead man's hand. Then photographs were taken. But Jesse James had learned to kill from Bloody Bill Anderson, and throughout his outlaw days, Jesse was more than willing to kill in the same brutal way he had learned during the Civil War. Jesse James is unique in the annals of the Old West. He was an outlaw's outlaw. He was a cold-blooded killer who at the same time was lionized by Southerners and America's Eastern press as a Robin Hood type hero. He stole more money than any other outlaw. His outlaw career lasted longer, 15 years, than any of the Wild West's killers. No other icon of the Wild West extended the Southern cause and revenge against the victorious North better than Jesse did. The cabin that you'd see behind us is where Jesse, of course, would have been born. And that, at the time, would have had a square-shaped addition on the east side that was about a story and a half that was used for the kids' bedrooms. And so they really did have a nice place here on 200 acres. Born here in 1847, Jesse was preceded by his older brother, Frank, by four years. From there, the James family grew. Early on, the family members would have consisted, of course, of the parents, Robert and Zerelda, and then Frank came along, and another boy was born but died early. Then Jesse was born, and next was Susan. Those were the James children. Then after the father went to California to start a church for the gold miners and did not return because he died of cholera, Zerelda married another man, Benjamin Sims. That did not work out. He and the boys just didn't get along. And then she married Dr. Reuben Samuel, and they had four more children together. So there was John T., Fanny, Sally, and Archie. When the Civil War started, President Abraham Lincoln quickly moved to occupy Missouri with Union troops. As a result, young Frank left the James farmstead to join the Confederate Army. The remaining James family is almost immediately targeted by the Union occupation forces because of their southern sympathies. Soon trouble comes to this quiet farm. Um, their stepfather was hanged to the point of unconsciousness by Unionists who came and visited their farm, and Jesse was beaten. Jesse's stepfather is now brain dead. 
and his mother and sister have been taken off to jail. Jesse essentially becomes the head of the household. This experience and his time served with Bloody Bill Anderson's Reign of Terror pretty much makes it impossible for Jesse to be anything other than an outlaw. Jesse entirely comes of age in a war-torn society. The Kansas-Missouri border from 1854 to 61 is just about the most dangerous place on earth. No allegiance is safe. If you say uh, you're a Union sympathizer, you're cooked. If you say you're a Southern sympathizer, that was the wrong thing. You could lose your life, you could lose your property, you could lose your family. It was not a safe place to be. Jesse is shaped entirely by that atmosphere. And then, of course, his family is drawn in personally. So Jesse never has the chance, I don't believe, to become anything other than a gorilla. Frank has the opportunity to reach a little maturity before those things start happening. And so I think Frank has a little something to fall back on. Frank can become a little more civilized than Jesse. I don't think Jesse can. I think um, he is so shaped by this that Jesse can never be a normal person. The other tried and true members of the James Gang are the Younger Brothers. They too are shaped by the Civil War. The Younger Brothers, Cole, Jim, and Bob, come from a well-to-do Missouri family. At first they were Union sympathizers. Cole, Jim, Bob, their dad, had a federal contract to carry the mail. So he has a lot invested with the success of the federal government and is trying to stay neutral during the war. At some point, Cole is accused of being a spy. Eventually, their father is murdered by Unionists, and the Youngers simply have no way to go except to guerrilla warfare. I really think that's a family that's pushed into it, that would not have gone that way otherwise. These people are pretty well off. They're... Uh, the Jameses are pretty average, but the Youngers are pretty well off when the war starts. And their mother is displaced by Orders Number 11 after the Lawrence Raid when the uh, Missouri border counties are emptied. Um, their mother's forced off their property. I mean, they essentially begin losing everything for the cause. So again, these are people with nothing to lose. Cold, the oldest of the Younger Brothers, hunts down his father's killer and shoots him dead. He then enlists in the Confederate Army. And like Frank James, later joins Quantrill's Raiders, forming a bond with Frank that would last until their deaths in the 20th century. After participating in Quantrill's bloody raids, Cole meets up with a 16-year-old Bell Star a soon-to-be notorious outlaw in her own right. It is believed that Cole fathered a daughter with Bell. At war's end, Cole is in California, supposedly seeking recruits for the Southern cause. Unlike Cole and Frank, Jim Younger stays with Quantrill until Quantrill's death in Kentucky. After General Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox, Jesse tries to follow suit, but with an entirely different result. When the war ended, Jesse James tried to surrender. He rides into town under a white flag, and he is shot in the chest by a, um, Union soldiers. And I have heard historians argue about that, but I'm, I don't know how you get past that. I don't know how you try to surrender and you're shot and you think you've got any chance of leading a normal life after that. I just don't know where you go with that fact other than where Jesse went. Now with the Youngers and the Jameses back in Missouri, they wondered how they will make a living as undefeated Southerners in the Union-occupied South. Well, after the Civil War, you had uh, still deep animosity running throughout the West and strains of North and South. And uh, a lot of these guys were trained to fight, but no one trained them how to stop fighting. 
And so they only knew one thing, and that was raiding. And then certainly in the case of the uh, Youngers and the James boys, uh, that's the one thing that they knew how to do. And of course, they had suffered under Reconstruction, and so they really wanted to strike back. And they were supported and protected by some of the biggest powers in the state of Missouri. Guerrillas were frowned on. They weren't taken back in like the former military were. So they had trouble obtaining jobs, and it just was easier to rob banks and trains than it was to to go ahead and, and live a normal life. As guerrillas, they were trained to just go in and help themselves. And at the end of the war, they were stripped of their citizenship, and this seemed like what was left up to them. They were trained to go in and help themselves, and they just kind of continued the war. In doing so, the Jameses and the Youngers redefined what it means to be an outlaw in the Old West. They are a new kind of gunslinger. Early in 1866, Frank James and Cole Younger are planning something that had never been done before. The Jameses and the Youngers were trying to find a way to screw the system. And I think the bank was the first place. And, of course, the bank robbery in Liberty is the first daylight bank robbery, which just set the nation talking because that somebody would walk into a bank in broad daylight and rob a bank was unheard of. Their take in the robbery was over $60,000, almost a million dollars in today's currency. Now James and the Youngers had a new way of earning a living. After recovering from his gunshot wounds, Jesse became the leader of the gang. Considering he was younger than Cole and Frank, there can be only one reason for his leadership role. He was simply more vicious. For seven years, the James Younger gang continued to rob banks and savings and loans. In their minds, they were not just stealing money, but attacking the most important symbols of Northern wealth and domination over Southerners during the Reconstruction period. In 1869, Jesse started a relationship with John Newman Edwards, editor of the Kansas City Star newspaper. He turned Jesse into a legend. A beacon of rebel resistance against Northern Reconstruction. Everybody wants a hero. The South was actually um, hurting from losing the war. And Frank and Jesse were, I don't know, built up into heroes by John Newman Edwards the man who was the writer for the Times, the editor for the Kansas City Times. He was also a Confederate, had ridden with Shelby during the war, and he wrote numerous articles on these guys, on perhaps why they were doing what they were doing, uh, that you know they were driven to this, that it, uh, for a long time, actually was an excuse that Jesse wasn't even involved. And the letters that were written uh, were written as though Jesse was writing them, but many of us believe John Newman Edwards actually wrote them. Jesse James knew he was famous. He sent letters to the editor. Uh, I think he rather enjoyed the, uh, the uh, attention, but then as the law got closer to him, he realized that also had some disadvantages. Seven years after perpetrating the first broad daylight bank robbery in American history, the gang went after an even more spectacular target, another majestic symbol of northern power and wealth. They robbed a train. The first one at Adair, Iowa, they derailed the train, pulled a rail out so the locomotive overturned and the engineer was killed. Um, they didn't let the fact that people might get dead get in their way. All in all, the James Younger Gang were reportedly responsible for as many as 25 robberies in eight states from 1866 to 1881. Here's a map of their heists. But the robbing of trains marked the beginning of the end for the James Gang. The railroad companies turned to the Pinkerton Detective Agency to protect their assets, to capture or kill the members of the James Younger Gang. 
Alan Pinkerton was a unionist through and through. If Jesse was exacting a vendetta against Northern oppression and Civil War injustices, Pinkerton now made it a personal vendetta against the James brothers. In 1874 alone, three Pinkerton agents were killed and the James Younger gang experienced its first loss. The youngest of the Younger brothers, John, was gunned down by Pinkertons. Then in January of 1875, the unthinkable happened at the James farm, where 13 years earlier, Jesse had been beaten by Yankees. The Pinkertons came out here in January the 25th to be exact in 1875 and I think they were just getting really embarrassed because they had figured they were going to be the ones to catch Frank and Jesse. They were top-notch detectives. Since 1866 when the boys started robbing in 1875 they've lost agents. They haven't caught anybody. They're getting frustrated. They were actually told to come out here and start fire to the cabin and I guess the weather was on the side of the James gang that night because it was snowing and it wouldn't catch. So they resorted to throwing things in through the window, and one of those things that came in through the window was a round metal ball. It went into the fireplace. How it got there is debatable, but at any rate, it exploded. Shrapnel hit Archie in the chest, that's the little eight-year-old boy, and he bled to death that night, which had been a horrible way to die. You know, or watch your child, I just I can't imagine. Mangles railed his hand and they had to amputate, so really bad night for the family. Ironically, Frank and Jesse weren't even there. How this atrocity affected Jesse's thinking is unclear, but the next raid was a disaster. His Waterloo occurred in 1876 at Northfield, Minnesota. That's when, in September, he robbed the bank in Northfield. And those people in Northfield, Minnesota, didn't look kindly to that. They ran out of the bank and they got their guns and they started shooting back. And eventually, several gang members and several town people were killed. Uh, the only ones who really escaped entirely were Frank and Jesse James. The, uh, all three younger brothers were wounded and captured. Cole Younger had 11 bullets in him after the Northfield, Minnesota bank raid. And he lived out his life. They thought he was dead. And he had a bullet that came in through the mouth and went up over his jaw and lodged next to his eye. And there's a famous photograph of him after his capture at Hanska Slough in Medellia, Minnesota. And here he is with his eye swollen shut. He has 11 bullets in him. And he lived another 25 years with those bullets still in his body. A similar fate might have befallen Frank and Jesse, except for their ruthless guerrilla training under William Quantrill and Bloody Bill Anderson. Frank James and Jesse James escaped from posse after posse after the Northfield, Minnesota raid. And they all the way through Minnesota, Iowa, all the way back to Missouri. And it would get too hot for these guys. These guys were so vicious and were willing to give up their life that the posses would back off. Eventually, the two brothers made it back to Missouri. But by now, it was nearly 15 years since the Civil War had ended. The western frontier had moved on, far from the James's original stomping grounds. No longer were Jesse and Frank in favor with the old guard southern sympathizers. New people were running the state, and they wanted Jesse out of the picture. Still, Jesse knew no other way to live. He had to form a new group, and that's when he recruited Bob and Charles Ford. He had ridden with Charlie Ford before, but Bob Ford was new. He was 20 years old and uh, turned out to be pretty dangerous for Jesse James. Jesse was last in this home of just the beginning of April because he came to, say, to see his mom and brought the Ford brothers with him. So we understand it, that Zerelda was very uh, uncomfortable with the Ford boys and warned Jesse, you know, this, this doesn't seem right. But, you know, Jesse kind of had his own mind, and they went to St. Joseph. Jesse, his wife, and two children moved into this pleasant-looking house on Christmas Eve, 1881. It was on a hill overlooking St. Joseph, Missouri. On April 3rd, 
He was in this room with Bob and Charles Ford making plans to rob the Platte City Bank the next day. It was a warm day and the front door was open and Jesse didn't want people to see him wearing guns so he took them off and laid them on the couch. And then he noticed the picture was hanging crooked. So he climbed on his chair and reached up to straighten the picture. And that was the first chance that the Ford brothers had to see Jesse without his guns. They drew their guns, only Bob fired. The bullet went in behind his right ear and some people think it came out over, over the left eye, leaving the legendary bullet hole. And Jesse fell to the floor dead and his, his wife and two children were in the house. She ran in and he died with his head in her lap. The Ford brothers ran out of the house and uh, went to the telegraph office sent a telegram to Governor Tom Crittenden announcing that they had killed Jesse James. It turned out the governor had basically hired the Fords to kill Jesse. At the age of 34, the West's greatest outlaw gunslinger was dead. However, Jesse became even more famous in death. Hollywood has made many movies about Jesse always a swashbuckling hero. Always noble in purpose. Not a bad legacy for a psychopathic, cold-blooded killer. Even before that fateful raid in Northfield, Minnesota, the Wild West had passed the James Younger gang by. It was now in such places as the cow towns of Kansas, the mining towns of Colorado and Arizona, and the Black Hills of South Dakota, and on the open ranges of New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. These new places would produce their own psychopathic killers and fresh gangs gangs such as the Daltons and the Wild Bunch that would create their own legends. Still, for the most part, the outlaws remained Southern sympathizers and the lawmen were Northern Unionists. This would not change until the Wild West vanished 20 years after Jesse's death. <laughs> 